Please pray with me. God is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. God makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. God revives my soul and guides me along right pathways for God's namesake. Amen. Please be seated. There are sermon slides. Don't advance it. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to let you know uh, that there's um, there's some there's some fun things. There's some fun things on Good Friday, which you all remember. I asked, "Who's in your corner?" Who's on your side? Who's your ride or die? Who's the Louise to your Thelma, right? Who, who's grabbing your hand as you drive off a cliff, right? This question is still relevant to me. I keep thinking about this. I can't help but sense that deep solidarity with other human beings has grown thin over the course of time. Through the myriad of moments pitting one group against another, avoiding wary sneezes and threatening sniffles, and love suffering over distance, it's easy to feel isolated, caught between having friends and having no one to rely on. Right? you caught between having friends and no one to rely on. Like, really rely on. Like, show up on a Saturday at noon in the middle of August to help you move large furniture type of rely on, right? That's the friend, the one person who shows up after your pleas, your many emails out to all your friends, that one person who shows up, friend for life, friend for life, right? While time and energy are factors in this, and as someone who is in the age of life where there are three children doing 1,400 different things, I don't stand still long enough to necessarily try to cultivate deep relationships that branch and bud into solidarity, right? I literally don't stand still long enough. The days of college dorm get-togethers and spending day in and day out are over, right? I'm still in school, but I have none of the benefits of being in school, okay? So I know that time and energy are a factor, but there's a bigger one. There's a lot of othering in our society, whether socio-politically, religiously, or relationally. We're bombarded with media images promoting material competition with, each, with, with, with others. We live in a world carrying a variety of threats to the welfare of our bodies in the world. You should not be terrified to ring someone's doorbell by accident. Right? Think about it. Or that when your doorbell rings, it's a threat. As an introvert, I tell you that when the doorbell rings, I go, <gasps> It literally happened about three weeks ago. Jack and I were home alone. We're the two strong, strong introverts. The doorbell rang, and he and I went, <gasps> just panic. And turned out it was a little kid looking to play with Liza. But I was like, it's safe. I had to peek. Right? But anyway, both sides, why that, 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 that disconnect, it's solidarity of humanity, right? We're bombarded with media images. We're everywhere we turn, there's a threat to the welfare of our bodies. This is the perfect environment to breed fear, okay? Fear of the other, fear of difference, fear of conflict, fear of confrontation, fear, fear, fear. And fear is always the undercurrent of anger. Oftentimes when you encounter an angry person, they're actually very terrified, right? When you run up against a dog who's aggressive, the dog is terrified, right? It, this idea spans across many different species of animal. We don't like being afraid because when we're afraid, we're weak and vulnerable. And so we go big. We get angry, right? And so we are all kind of walking about half cocked, ready to protect ourselves from a threat. In psychology, this is called hypervigilance. Do you know what that is? Always on the lookout. Okay? Hypervigilance has a bestie, to quote the kids. Right? It has a BFF. And it's called hyperarousal. 
Oh, and when these two get together, it's quite the show, all right? Always on the lookout for a threat. When one is perceived, boom, explosion, okay? It's an explosion because hyperarousal is just waiting to use every muscle of the human body to protect the, the vulnerable person. And vigilance is always looking for something, right? And when you look for something, aren't you going to find it everywhere, right? If you want, it, it, it's just common sense, psychologically speaking. If you are looking for people to dislike you, everywhere you look, you will find people who dislike you, right? It's like that moment when someone says, oh, hey, you go to Nativity. Uh, do you know Scott Wood? And you're like, oh, wait, our church is so huge. I don't know if I do know Scott Wood. But then like the next week, you're like, everywhere you turn, it's Scott Wood and it's Scott Wood. And then you hear about it, right? It's one of those moments that when you, your brain sort of goes on the lookout for something, you start to, right, we're always, we're always talking about our junior, our faithful junior warden. Um, but we, we look, we will find the things we're looking for. If you're looking for comfort, you'll find it. If you're looking for a threat, you'll find it. And our environment right now tells us everywhere, look for the threat, look for the threat, look for the threat, look for the threat. Hyper vigilance, which means as soon as you perceive a threat, you want to protect yourself, you're going to. And it could have dastardly outcome for you and for other people. It's hard to gain ground with an other if this type of air is swirling about fragile and delicate human bodies wrapped in a rather porous and vulnerable epidermal layer. You're not crabs and lobsters, right? Or are you? Some of you might be, right? I think of men in black in the Edgar suit and zipping right up right? But you're not. You're actually fleshy human beings and you're very, very vulnerable. So when fear and anger, hypervigilance and hyperarousal are in the mix, threatening to rear their head and shove love and grace out of the window, it makes it really hard to cultivate rich relationships extending beyond social acquaintances into, of course, I'll come move that mahogany armoire with you this August on a Saturday at noon, right? It's you've got to cultivate, to cultivate that deep solidarity, you have to be able to be vulnerable. You can't be vulnerable in this environment, though. Okay? But I'm not hopeless. I'm not hopeless because church. As naive as this sounds, because of the invisible and visible church exists. Now, when church is bad, it can be very bad. A lot of spiritual trauma, physical trauma, emotional trauma has come in through the church, through its leaders. So it can be very bad. Never want to not acknowledge that. But when it's good, it's so, so, so good. Because in this event of church churching well, love draws human beings together into solidarity in their need and abundance, their sickness and health, and in their anxiety and comfort. Now, they were attending constantly to the teaching of the apostles and in fellowship, to the breaking of bread and in prayers. And all those who believed were up to the same things. And they were having all things in common. They were selling both possessions and properties, and they were distributing things to all in accordance to who was having need or necessity. Acts 2, 42, and then 44 to 45. I jumped there, right? I jumped there. There's something spectacular about the life of the early church right after Jesus was raised. Luke describes how the followers of the way, which is what I'm calling them because they're not Christians, because Christians don't come into existence until this message of the one raised, who was God and who was humanity, actually extends into the territory of the Gentiles. These aren't the first Christians. These are the first people who are following the way of Jesus who they thought was the Messiah, as opposed to the children of Israel who didn't think so. They're, this is all one still, okay? At this point, animosity is not the theme of the day. The followers of the way clearly existed alongside the other children of the house of Israel, okay? 
Luke tells us that they were attending constantly to the teachings of the apostles and in the prayers, spending their time together. Now you can go to that next slide. Okay? Literally, day by day, being of the same things, being of the same mind. Okay? That's what this means. That kath hemeron, right, means according to the day, if you're going to translate it literally, but it's kind of a colloquialism. It means day by day, daily. Daily, they were doing that little particle, te, is sort of links it back to the previous statement. It means it's connected. It's further explaining what came before. All right? And then that massive word that if you were Greek, ancient Greek, and you were playing Scrabble and you played, you won the whole entire game flat out right? That proskar terontes homothumadon, okay? Meaning that they were attending constantly with one mind, literally speaking. But that sounds like bees, right? So I've translated it as at the same time, attending constantly at the temple at the same time. Can you go to the next one? Into ero, in the temple, if you ever wondered where they were gathering to worship and to learn more and to study and to pray and to break bread and to be together as one all the time, day in and day out, in the temple, that's where they went. That animosity and friction and fraction and all that stuff hadn't occurred just yet. Okay, let me find myself here. Okay. They were breaking apart the house bread, sharing in food and exhilaration and sincerity of heart. Imagine like an exuberant Thanksgiving of food, all right? They were praising God and having grace toward the entire people. Can you go, Tan Leon. This word, Tan Leon, okay, looks banal, the people. But it is, if you know Luke's history, if you know the people of Israel's history, Tan Leon is the word for the people of God. Okay? They were communing all together, having grace and love towards the people of God, the other ones at the temple. Okay? Tan Leon. Acts actually does this interplay between Tan Leon or uh, Ha Leos. Okay, and um, uh, tone ethnone, okay, the people out of the other nations. And it does this interplay to the point where the people and the other nations become synonymous. It's really, really neat. Anyway, so I wanted to highlight that. That's not just the people. In this book, in this moment, it means the people of God, okay? All those who believed, pantes hoi pistoiontes, all those who believe, that's a participle with a, with a definite article, meaning the ones who believe. All of the ones who believed, okay, in this message, lived with each other, not in name only as if neighbors who casually exchanged hellos or that two-finger wave, you know what I'm talking about? You do it <laughs> when you're driving, oh, hey, right? <laughs> you just make sure you get the right, if you do one finger, you have to get the right one. Otherwise, you're going to have a fight with your neighbor, right? Okay, so it's more than just like this friendly hellos or a wave or a, you know, how's the kids, right? It's, it's a more living together. They were with each other by being for each other and for no other reason than love and faith, mercy and grace, the draw of the spirit of God into the fullness of life with the neighbor, for the neighbor in the world, Okay, that's a big whole pot of people living together for each other, looking out for each other, being concerned with their well-being. Okay, the reign of God is born through the cracks and crevices, breaking through the kingdom of humanity. Through that solidarity, this community is manifesting, almost pulling up from the ground or maybe from the down, uh, up, down, or the down, up, the reality of Christ into their material lives. This is straight up Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I'm not saying Luke copied Dietrich Bonhoeffer because that chronology doesn't work, but Bonhoeffer definitely tapped into this with his understanding of Christ reality, okay? We Christians pull this up into our, our realm. We live it into the world. Otherwise, it still remains abstract, kind of isolated to the spiritual realm, right? But it has to hit the temporal realm. Willie James Jennings writes this about our passage from Acts. Be careful, it's a really long, hard quote. Life with Jesus must give shape to life in the spirit. 
That's what this is about. Okay, love knows no other way than to break down barriers and hurdles, hindering our ability to see each other's humanity. Everything about these early followers of the way was pulled into the community, founded and built by God's love for the world. Under the draw of divine love, it becomes impossible to cling to those things that they clung to prior to encounter with God. Those material markers of identity, whatever those possessions are, right? Those goods or those possessions, that property, or that things, the things that you own, they fall by the wayside because they can no longer classify your identity because that is anchored and linked to the one who is risen again. And so those old markers of identity fall away like linen garments left behind in a tomb in the event of resurrection. That old identity, the way you justified yourself previously falls away. Okay, by faith, those who followed the way found their identity in God by faith in Christ. And if this, then they found mutual identity with others. And not only those who also believe like they did, but among and with those who followed different paths. They were in the temple. Okay? This is God's heart for the world and in the world, to love others as you have been loved by God, to see the humanity in others, to give as you have received, to be wrapped up in the divine passion for the beloved, to see not an other, but one just like you. Just like you. Luke's storytelling point here is not to propose a fiscal or political platform. Okay? We never want to make political platforms straight out of the gospel doesn't end well, okay? Rather, his goal is to ask his reader to reconsider their way of faith in following the Christ by the power of the Spirit. Luke wants to demonstrate what solidarity looks like, founded on divine love, born of divine life and liberation. This is not about refusing individuality at the expense of the community, but rather about showing how each person is intimately linked to the other in love and life. That one person's well-being is connected to another's well-being. It's not about everyone thinking the same, being the same, or believing the same. It's about valuing the humanity in another person, seeing their need, their sickness, their fear as one's own. It's about identifying with another's plight as Christ, God of very God, identified with humanity's plight, and did not condemn humanity, but, to, but brought humanity into the very life of God, the source of love, life, and liberation in the world as it is in heaven. And a quick reference to last week, Luke wants you to ask, what must we do? Now that I have been so encountered, what must I do? So, conclusion. We do not need to go this world alone. Okay? While our world is quite different from the world of the first followers of the way, it does not mean that we can't still have solidarity with one another. And in fact... It would be radical so to do. It would be radical to have that depth of solidarity. What we find in Luke's description in Acts is not a formula for church, but the formation of what church should be. It's the formation of church. The thematic structure of the story tells us that our neighbor is more important than things. That community is better than isolation. That going the distance is what love does. That being here for each other in the good and the bad, when things are going well and when they're going poorly, when it's a great mood or it's a yikes mood, okay? It's about profound connection where the foundation is just shared humanity, clothed in the heavenly fabric of divine love, love that knows no limits. When church dares to put on church, when its witness shares in the witness of Christ, it can be a beautiful place of affirmation, confirmation, and solidarity in the world for the beloved. When church dares to church, it radiates divine life into the world, beckoning those who have lost their way in the world, or those who have become alienated and isolated, or those who suffer under the weight of oppression and marginalization, unto the warmth and comfort of the eternal and heavenly substance that is the love that just loves. Those who have ears to hear, let them hear.